Mr. Jan Lipovsky, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. Mr. Lars Loke Rasmussen, my colleague from the Kingdom of Denmark. Uh, Mr. Magnus Hunike, Minister of Environment from Denmark. Mr. Lars Agard, Minister of Climate, Energy, Utilities. Uh, Mr. Silvio Shembri, Minister of Economy, uh, European Funds and Roads of Malta. Mr. Sanjeev Bajaj, President CII, uh, and uh, Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, DGCII, dear friends. Uh, first of all, let me begin by commending the CII, the Confederation of Indian Industry, for conceptualizing and executing this inaugural edition of the India-Europe Business and Sustainability Conclave. I also congratulate Denmark for partnering us on this conclave and the Czech Republic, Lithuania, Malta and the UK uh, for their association with the event. I would particularly, uh, I would particularly appreciate the fact that two of my distinguished colleagues, foreign ministers, are here today sharing the dais. I had an opportunity yesterday and this morning uh, to discuss our bilateral uh, partnerships with them. And uh, my Czech colleague uh, Jan pointed out that we had met four times uh, in the recent past. Uh, I think part of it is an association I had uh, in my diplomatic career with the Czech Republic. I think there's still a hangover from that. Uh, and uh, I was reminding Minister Rasmussen that I actually met him when he was here as Prime Minister, when I was one of you, uh, in my corporate capacity. Uh, and uh, we then discussed uh, how to take the relationship forward. And in the years that have passed, there has actually been very uh, commendable uh, progress. So, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me emphasize that businesses have a primary role in driving sustainability, and that is why we are all meeting here today. The enabler, however, is the larger partnership and the understanding between India and Europe. India and the European Union believe in a multipolar global order, share a commitment to promoting effective multilateralism, and are increasingly considerate to each other's geopolitical, economic, strategic, and security concerns. Visits and exchanges at the highest level are today a regular feature between India and Europe, including at the Prime Minister's level. I have personally interacted with the foreign ministers of all the 27 EU member states and the high representative uh, of, the, uh, of the European Commission at least once last year. I've also met some of them actually multiple times. So a good example was there on the dais. And these interactions have contributed to the resumption of the India-EU FTA negotiations, the India-EU Trade and Technology Council, which we call the TTC, uh, the announcement of that, dialogues in areas of security and defense and human rights, and not least, a jump in bilateral trade. For a sharper focus, we recently announced three working groups within the India-EU TTC for strategic cooperation in trade, cooperation in green transition, and cooperation in digital partnership. I'm glad that these three pillars in the, uh, are reflected in the agenda of this conclave. Allow me to briefly highlight these three imperatives which will surely sustain our business relations, not just our business relationship, but the overarching partnership between India and large parts of Europe, and indeed the sustainability of the planet itself. So a few words about trade. The EU is one of India's largest and most important trade partners. Our bilateral trade was in excess of US dollars 115 billion uh, in the financial year 2021-22, which is the highest ever. With the UK and other non-EU countries added, uh, 
uh, I believe that uh, the number is even greater. Now we expect the India-EU FTA will be a game changer for the India-EU relationship. We look forward to a mutually beneficial, a mutually advantageous uh, conclusion to the negotiation process uh, within a reasonably short planned timeline. India's new approach to trade agreements addresses issues of non-tariff and behind the borders barriers, quality, standards, and related benchmarks. With like-minded partners, we have actually demonstrated in recent years a fast-track change in our FTA negotiation processes. The FTAs with UAE and Australia were actually concluded uh, in record time. India's large and growing middle-class population makes it obviously a preferred investment destination as well as a lucrative market for our trade partners. India is expected to be the only major economy to keep growing at well above 6% per annum in the foreseeable future and thus will remain one of the major growth engines of the world. Now, when it comes to the green transition, clean energy and green transition are central to the India-EU connectivity partnership. Synergies have emerged in solar and wind energy, in green hydrogen, smart grids, sustainable urban transports, especially metro projects, waste management, and the circular economy. But to sustain this cooperation, the real ask is capacity building, clean technology transfer, alignment of standards, and cooperation in critical materials. And here, let me say upfront that promoting green financing is the ignition for any long-term result-oriented outcome. India is today one of the leading countries in climate change mitigation commitments and environmental protection. Our low carbon development strategy lays out the path to a carbon neutral economy while taking into account specific development goals. We have the third biggest installed renewable energy capacity in the world. Without stressing on our ambitious nationally determined contributions at the UNFCCC, let me say that we will reach our goals even earlier. Now looking ahead, India's ambitious green hydrogen policy incentivizes an indigenous ecosystem for local needs and exports. In this, we have already seen collaborations between many major European firms and Indian companies. Electric vehicles, as Minister Rasmussen noted, will be the next big thing for a green transition of India's urban landscape. Green transition is also the core of our sustainability goals and it is enshrined in our agenda for the G20 presidency. And uh, in fact, Prime Minister Modi's life initiative adds the dimension of individual responsibility and ownership of our environment in the synergy with India's declared climate and environmental goals. Now, speaking about digital transformation, last year, many of you are aware that 41% of the world's transactions actually happened in India. Our highly developed tech sector and an increasing pool of quality skilled human power in the software services sector are obviously a given. Newer technologies like additive manufacturing, high performance computing and AI are increasingly the emerging focus. We are also putting together an indigenous chip making ecosystem. India today can boast of more than 100 unicorns, many of them in the tech sector. But our digital success stories goes beyond these unicorns. It touches the common person. We have pioneered digital public goods on a scale previously unimaginable. Our innovative digital solutions for identification and banking, Aadhaar, and digital transactions, UPI, are unprecedented in reducing transaction costs and turning digital and financial inclusivity 
into a reality almost overnight for hundreds of millions of our citizens. Our indigenous development of 5G and digital commerce will surely empower our citizens even further. India's development through the digital model is affordable, transparent, scalable, socially transformative, and predominantly open sourced. This model could be implemented in other countries and be integral to our development partnership and capacity building cooperation with the rest of the world, especially the global south. Digital connectivity is vital to the India-EU connectivity partnership and can include knowledge exchanges and capacity building in AI, quantum and high performance computing, 5G and 6G, semiconductors, cyber security and digital platforms. This could also serve to exchange views on strategic, political and security implications of new and emerging technologies. Europe, I want to emphasize, is a natural partner in these areas. To all this now, let me say a few words on the future of India and the EU uh, partnership. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a subject on which you can see that the government has invested a lot of resources and attention in recent years. Uh, and I share the hopes of Minister Rasmussen and Minister Lepavsky that we will see uh, much more uh, progress uh, in the days ahead. Now, many of you would have read terms like the fastest growing major economy or well placed to negotiate global headwinds or one of the world's largest markets, or even home to a youthful and growing quality workforce. These are actually today descriptions that we hear in Europe about India. How did we get there? Allow me to share how our cards have stacked up in recent years. In the last nine years, Prime Minister Modi has undertaken several structural economic reforms, some of which were clearly politically counterintuitive. Nudging the informal economy to the organized sector, cleansing the financial system, rationalizing taxation, incentivizing production, doubling down on infrastructure and logistics, digitizing the government's interface with its citizens, and ushering in an ambitious energy transition each one of this was part of a policy mix which is today paying off. And that, mind you, is still just the beginning. We want our friends in Europe to appreciate that this momentum and its compounding strength will take us towards becoming a developed society by 2047. And along with that will grow the accompanying business opportunities. India's economic comeback and credentials are matched by our geopolitical weight, deriving from a strategic location in the Indo-Pacific region, and an increasing defense and first responder capability. Europe and India can strengthen each other's strategic autonomy by reducing dependencies, cooperating on critical technologies, and ensuring supply chain restructuring. The India-EU FTA is therefore a very important goal. And the TTC will provide the structure and strategic guidance to this partnership as it moves forward. So in closing, I would like to say that India's relations with Europe are stronger and deeper than ever before. And this event itself is a testimony of that assertion. Between us, rest the largest democratic and free market space globally. The business communities of India and Europe have a large stake and an enabling role in this transformation. I hope your deliberations will reflect what is at stake here, stake here not just for us but for the entire world, and how we can join hands to realize the economic dividends and democratic values that are inherent in our partnership. Thank you for your attention.